Now in this section, we are starting to dig into some of the mechanics of accounting. We're going to be talking about the accounting cycle in general, or at least part of it. So the, the section here is entitled Source Documents, Journal Entries, and Posting. These are some of the, the actual bookkeeping aspects of accounting. So as an overview, we're going to be talking about transactions throughout this section. Basically a transaction is something that happens financially, economically between one party and another party. So it's something we need to record. And a simple example of a transaction would be the company going to the vendor and buying supplies. That's a transaction. We have external versus internal transactions. This chapter, this section, we are focusing mostly on the external transactions which would be the example that I just gave. An internal transaction would be when two different entities within the company itself are transacting. So for example, you know, the first one was where we went and bought supplies. That was an external transaction. Now let's say Department A goes to use some of those supplies from the storeroom. Now we have an internal transaction to record. Those are more adjusting entries that we will see in later sections. When we use the term source documents, we're basically talking about any sort of evidence that a transaction occurred. So it is the proof that there was a transaction. It could be an invoice, a receipt, a check, anything like that that shows an amount, a party, a date, a description, anything like that. It's the source of our accounting information. Now all these things, when we have these transactions that are supported by source documents, we record these through a journal entry. So this is where we start to bring up the terminology for debits and credits. Certainly you've probably heard that before, the terms debits and credits, a debit card, a credit card, but now we're going to start to talk about what that means from an accounting perspective. What we have in this list is the accounting cycle. These are steps in a particular order that drive how accounting flows. Now this is not something you necessarily need to memorize at this time. You need to understand the basic order and what steps have to occur first. So the very first step is we are analyzing the transaction to see what happened. We're looking at the invoices, the source documents. We've now identified that a transaction took place. The very first bookkeeping step is to record a journal entry. A journal entry is just a chronological record of transactions showing what accounts they impacted. We'll see some examples later on. Once we record the journal entry, we then have to pull it apart. There are going to be at least two pieces to it, possibly more. We have to pull it apart and post the increase or decrease to each individual account. What we have now is the unadjusted trial balance. So when we post those journal entries to the ledger, every account has its own detail. It has its own ending balance. We pull all the ending balances for all of those accounts and we put them in a summary report known as the unadjusted trial balance. We're going to see the trial balance three times as you can see in this list. The first one is the unadjusted because it was before we posted adjustments. The next step would be to complete the adjusting entries themselves, which will actually be a later chapter. But the adjusting entries, they are still journal entries, but they have a specific purpose. They're generally done at the end of a period. And then we have the adjusted trial balance showing what the new account balances are after posting all those adjusting entries. Then we have our final set of entries for the period known as closing entries. We are basically closing out revenues, expenses, and dividends as we briefly discussed in the, in the prior chapters. We are closing those out to retain earnings. Again, this will all make sense when we get to that point. After that is done, we have the post-closing trial balance, which shows us which accounts still have a balance and what that balance is. That's the end of the period and then we start the next period over. We repeat the whole cycle. So when we get into the discussion of debits and credits, this is important to understand. This is how things uh, 
get recorded in accounting. We need to know whether to debit an account or to credit an account. It's not, uh, we're not saying we increase or decrease an account. That's not the verbiage we use. Instead, we use a debit or credit, and we'll see why in just a bit. Now, the important thing I want to point out here is that you, you've probably heard the terms debits and credits before, and you may have in your mind an understanding of what those terms mean. Debit cards versus credit cards at the bank, or on your checking account register, which we'll see an example of later, you probably see the debit or credit heading. Forget everything you've learned at that point from personal finance, because we're going to see from the accounting perspective it's different for a, a valid reason, and I'll explain that more later on. So right off the bat, when you hear the terms debits and credits, or debit and credit, these are opposites. You can't immediately say that a debit is an increase or a decrease, or that a credit is an increase or a decrease. They're the opposite. Some accounts use debits to increase, other accounts use debits to decrease, and vice versa with the credits. So we have to understand the rules to understand how do we increase a certain account, how do we decrease it. If you find out that a particular account happens to be increased by a debit, then what you can tell right away is that a credit will decrease it. Again, I mentioned that some accounts are increased by debits, others are increased by credits. The rules we're going to see here in just a little bit are known as normal balance rules. I'll show why that normal balance term is used to describe this, but it tells you which account is a debit account, which means it's debited to increase it, and which account is a credit account, which means it's credited to increase it. Another rule you have to understand is that debits are always on the left and credits are always on the right. We'll see a T account, we'll see some journal entries, but debits are always left and they always come first. Credits are always on the right and they, they're indented to the right, they come after all of the debits. The other thing that's important is that the term debit is not debt. It's not the same word at all. It has a similar Latin base to it, but a debit does not mean you owe somebody money. We'll, we'll explain some of that a little bit later on. Often you'll see abbreviations for both debits and credits. DR is the abbreviation for debit, and that actually stands for debit record, DR. Credits, again, they're always on the right-hand side. Don't confuse this with a creditor someone you owe money to, and the abbreviation again is credit record, CR for credit record. Here's an example of a journal entry, just a simple journal entry. There's a date, there's a transaction showing what accounts were impacted, and there's an amount. Now, an important thing to note here, you always have to have at least two accounts. You can actually have more than two in a particular entry. In this case, we have uh, two debits to cash and accounts receivable. That's what AR stands for. And then one credit to revenue. You can have odd numbers, so two debits, one credit, that's fine. The rule, however, is that your amounts have to balance. Your debit amounts in total have to balance your credit amounts in total. 100 plus 150 is 250, which matches our credit amounts. This is another example of a journal entry. Shows we have the cash we're debiting for 100, revenue we're crediting for 100, notice the, the indentation. Oftentimes you'll see an explanation underneath of it, but that's not always needed. And in fact, as you get used to reading journal entries, you'll be able to understand what's going on without actually seeing the transaction explanation. So this is what I was explaining earlier. You can have two debits and one credit as long as your total debit dollar amounts balance your total credit dollar amounts. Now the next step, once we have journalized or created a journal entry, sometimes it's just referred to as recording, once we have the journal entry ready to go, we have to pull the journal entry apart into its specific accounts 
and we have to post those accounts, post to those accounts. So the debit to $500 for cash has to be brought over to the cash account as $500 there on the debit side. The credit to revenue has to be brought over on the revenue account on the credit side. Now notice the balance of any account is the difference between the debits and credits and the balance always falls on the side with the highest amount. So for cash we have $500 debit and zero dollars credit so we have a balance of five hundred dollars on the debit side revenues in this case everything was on the credit side there are no debits so we have a balance of five hundred dollars on the credit side here we have another journal entry again a debit to inventory a credit to cash so what we're doing is we're posting each piece of the journal entry the reason I have this second journal entry is that now you can see here we have two different entries for cash. We have a debit of $500 to cash and a credit of $200 to cash. The difference is now only $300. 500 minus 200, it still falls on the debit side because there are more debits than credits. The balance of any account, again, is the difference between the debits and credits, and it's always going to fall on that side with the highest balance. Now here I specifically left out the account name so we can't tell whether this $50 debit balance is positive or negative because we don't know what type of account it is. Same with this one. We can't tell whether this $150 credit balance is positive or negative because we don't know what type of account it is. We just know whether it has a debit or credit balance. Now, once we know the normal balance rules, which actually this comes up in another discussion, once we know the normal balance of an account, we know how to increase it, and we know we have to do the opposite to decrease it. So if we find out that the normal balance of an account is a debit, we know that to increase that particular account, we debit it. To decrease it, we credit it. Now, if a, a certain account has a normal debit balance, but then the, the ending balance actually falls on the credit side for that particular account, that tells us it's not normal, so it's negative, it's abnormal. That means that account has a negative balance. There aren't all that many accounts where that even makes sense. One example I like to throw out though, it's not a good one as far as it shouldn't happen, but at least theoretically you can see that it can happen. Cash with your bank account. I'm going to tell you here that cash as an asset has a normal debit balance. If you end up with a total credit balance for that account, that means it's negative. That means you have overdrawn your account and you better fix that pretty quick. So that's what we're saying with the normal balance rules. Again, this comes up in a later discussion where we go through the normal balance rules. Debit credit rules, I talked about a couple of them. Every journal entry has to have balanced debits and credits. So the total number of debits for any individual journal entry has to balance the total number of credits, total dollar amount of credits, has to be the same. Now in an individual T account, so the T account was where we showed each account and we said here's a debit side, here's a credit side. The debits and credits there don't have to balance and in fact if they did balance that would mean there was a zero balance in that account. Take the cash example we saw earlier we said we had uh, I think a $500 debit a 300 or maybe a yeah $300 credit so we ended up with a $200 balance on the debit side that just meant that the debits and credits did not balance out and they didn't need to. However, when you bring all of those particular accounts back in on the trial balance, the total debits from all accounts do have to match the total credits from all the accounts as well, as we can see in this example. Some of these accounts have a normal debit balance. Some of them had a credit balance. In the end, we have the same total dollar amount for all of our debit accounts as compared with all of our credit accounts.